Bucky Fuller, who I served with on the Hunger Project Advisory Council for nine years, who died not too long ago, said that 99% of who you are, you can't touch, you can't see, you can't smell. 99% of you is untouchable, unsmellable, invisible. It is what Ken Kyes has called your, your conscious awareness. It's, your, it's what looks out behind those eyeballs. What is that? It isn't, it isn't cells. It's some kind of conscious awareness that you are. And make no mistake about it, you've occupied a whole lot of bodies already. Now this is not reincarnation talk. Although, I don't know about this reincarnation. People ask me if I believe in it. I said, well, I taught in a junior high school in the inner city of Detroit for four years. And I saw those dead bodies come to life every day at three o'clock. <laughs> so I believe <laughs> in reincarnation, all right? Now, if what you, if 99% of who you are, you can't touch and you can't feel and you can't smell, then where did, what is it? Who is it? Where are you? What is this thing called your essence or who you are? And where does it go? Now think of this. You were in a body. I have a little baby girl who's uh, 11 months old. And she, and we were all in a body that size. Well, it's only a body about this big. Got fingers only this long. <laughs> you know? Got uh, tiny, tiny little parts all over the place. I mean, she's only this tall. Now, is that her? Is that her essence? Because I have other children who are much older, and I am much older than that, and I can remember being three and being in a different body. Still me, still my essence there, different body, totally different, doesn't even look anything like when I was 11 months old. And then I was 13 and had a funny body at 13. But still my essence was there in a whole new body. Hairs growing all over the place that I didn't understand, all kinds of things happening to it, you know. Then hairs falling out of it later on. <laughs> You know, looking at those hairs that fall out and say, what held it in yesterday? You know, what, I don't know. I don't even understand that. Okay. And so it's like who I am has been in many, many bodies already. All right. And that essence, you see, everything on our planet that is alive can never die. It can never die. Life doesn't die. It just transforms. It just moves on to new places and new ways of being, new ways of being. And the way of being that is the most transcendent of all is this way that comes from seeing yourself as love and only having that to give away. Only having that to give away. Let's say I were to stand up here in front of you and just visualize for a moment that I have an orange. And I take this orange and I squeeze it as hard as I can squeeze it, okay? What's going to come out? Juice. What kind of juice? Orange juice. Apple juice, any chance? Once in a while? Come on, now and then. A little mango juice come out of an orange once in a while? No mistakes, right? Never, no matter what. Next question. Everybody passes. These are easy, okay? Why? When you squeeze an orange, as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? Because that's, not because it's an orange, because that's what's inside. Isn't it? On our planet, when you squeeze something, what comes out of it is what's inside. Not too difficult, all right? Does it matter if your mother squeezes the orange? Does it matter what instrument she uses? Does it matter if you just had your period and then you squeeze an orange? <laughs> Does it matter if your boss squeezes it? How about if your kids do it? Your kids squeeze an orange. Does it matter? Does it matter what time of day? Suppose they do it at noon, all right? How about at four in the morning? Does that matter? Whenever you squeeze an orange, the only thing you get out is what's inside, right? No arguments. Same thing works for you. Same principle works for you. It's a principle of the universe, all right? Someone squeezes you. That is, someone puts pressure on you. Someone says things about you that you don't like. Someone puts uh, attention on you, whatever. Your boss says something to you that you don't like. And out of you comes anger. And out of you comes hatred. And out of you comes fear. Or out of you comes stress. Or out of you comes 
Tension. Why? Is it because of your boss and the way they squeeze you? Never. Is it because of your mother? I mean, she really can be a pain sometimes, right? Is it because of your children? No. What comes out of you always when someone squeezes you is what's inside. This is the, the vital principle of being a no-limit person. It's so crucial to get this and understand that. That if you have any hatred in your heart for anyone in this world or any anger or any fear or any of those things, it has nothing to do with the rest of the world. It only has to do with what you put inside. Now, how does what gets inside of you get there? That's the key. How does it get there? As you think. Only as you think. You see, there's no anger in the world. There's no stress in the world. There's no tension. It's perfect. We've already established. It's perfect place. It works just fine. It's all flowing the way it's supposed to flow. The evidence for it is, it is. <laughs> That's all the evidence you need. Just look around you. Everything out there is a miracle. Everything, including you. There are no mistakes. It's all perfect. And everything that happens to you in your life, whether it's a trauma, whether it's a disease, whether it's somebody treating you in a certain way, there's a lesson in all of it. No limit people understand the lesson in life and therefore celebrate the lessons. I, I think when you have a desire to align yourself in a, in, a, in a sort of uncomplicated way and keeping yourself close to God, because Socrates had a very uh, a significant observation, you know, a couple thousand years ago. He said he, he is nearest to God who needs the fewest things. He is nearest to God who needs the fewest things. And uh, the idea that, the, the, that, the, uh, that you have to have more and you also have to, your life has to be very difficult and very complicated and, and you have to attend a lot of meetings and you have to satisfy everybody. Why do you think it's so hard for people to say no? Well, it, it's uh, it, it's there's this whole element of uh, that you're being a bad person, that there's, mm. there's something wrong with you if you're if you're uh, if you're turning down somebody else's request. I mean, I have I, I get mailed by the by the thousands now, and I have for many many years, and I have many 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 people out there who have these wonderful these great ideas about what it is that uh, they would like to do. And uh, and then this project that they have, or this particular uh, thing that they're going to do, and so on, and they want me to be a part of it and to get on the board for it and to do all of these kinds of things. And I just very politely say that that's just, I'm just not able to do that, and I don't tell myself that I should feel go around feeling guilty uh, about being able to just say I want to I want my life to run the way I want it to run, rather than the way somebody else has dictated that it will run. Mm -hmm. And having that comp that kind of confidence in yourself and the belief that that it's okay to just say to say no to these things and i must say it hasn't always been that easier for me so let me just go through real quickly through these uh, these steps i don't know if i can get through all of them but the first one says unclutter your life you know you'll simplify your life and you'll be closer to god and you'll be a, a more inspired person this is in the book inspiration that starts on page 102 unclutter your life so, which means if you haven't worn it in the past uh, year or two, just recycle it and give it away to others. Just go through your closet. It's a wonderful uh, exercise to do. Go through your closet, pick out everything that you haven't worn in the last uh, 18 months or so, and just get rid of it. Just put it in a pile and, and pass it along to somebody else. Get rid of old files that take up all this kind of space. Donate the un unused t uh, t uh, toys and tools and books and bicycles and, and all of these kinds of things to charitable people. Go through your garage on clutter your life. Get rid of anything that keeps you mired in the state of acquisition and, and having to have more. And then secondly, clear your calendar of unwanted and unnecessary activities and obligations. Um, so, you know, take a look at that little book that seems to dictate your life and just try to keep days in there and long periods of time in there where you're free to just make... <laughs> Make yourself available to God. Make yourself available to be and do what it is that you came into this world to do. And then keep your free time free. Be on the lookout for uh, invitations to functions that keep you on top of society's pyramid, but that inhibit your access to joyful inspiration. Truly, everybody out there listening, truly, um, my most enjoyable kind of an evening is an, an e it's not an evening in, in which I have a whole lot of people over and people are drinking and there's, uh, you know, there's party time and so on. 
Uh, it's it's an evening alone, an evening of meditation, an evening of reading, an evening of of uh, studying. I'm, I'm working on a book called Living the Tao, and I read the Tao every day. My my job every day right now is to get up in the morning and to uh, read one of the 81 verses of the Tao, to study it, to contemplate it, to think about it, and then to write an essay about how to apply it, to channel uh, the great teachings of Lao Tzu from 2,500 years ago, and to listen to that and connect to it. I feel that that's one of the most glorious, exciting, exquisite experiences I've ever had in my life. I, I laid in bed last night, and I was talking to someone that I love very much, and I was just saying, I can't even believe that my job is just to do this wonderful this wonderful work of, of studying, you know, 2,500-year-old literature. And to me, it's the most exquisite and peaceful. And I'm in bed 8 o'clock almost every evening, 8.30 at the, at the latest, because I'm up at 3 uh, in the middle of the night. If you saw my PBS show, it's like you remember what Rumi said, you know, the morning breeze or the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. I love to be awake in the middle of the night when you're closest to God. Four, I say take time for meditation and yoga. Uh, when you guys called me to do the show just a little while ago, I said, you've got to call, give me five minutes, uh, <laughs> and uh, I need five more minutes, because uh, I had just come out of a yoga class, and I was soaking wet, and I just wanted to uh, you know, take off those uh, those clothes. But to, for me, t- doing yoga every day and meditating every day, are they're not just fun activities that I do to fit in. They are the most important things that I do every single day because they keep me centered. They keep me focused on God. Then I say in here, return to the simplicity of nature. Spend more time outdoors. Spend time amongst the plants and the animals and the trees and hiking and, and walking. Another thing that I do every single day because I don't have my life cluttered up with all kinds of meetings and businesses and um, put distance between yourself and your critics. Um, align yourself with people who are like-minded in their search for simplified inspiration. Whether it's your manager, whether it's your attorney, whoever it is, if they're not bringing you peace, if they're not serving your needs in a way that you want to keep your life on purpose and simplified, then you're not removed. Then you're removing yourself from spirit, and inspiration won't be possible. Here are some of those fears: fear of failing. Get rid of it. You cannot fail at anything. Everything you do produces a result. It is what you do with the results that counts. Labeling yourself a failure is meaningless. Fear of disapproval. Get rid of it. You do not need external validation. You are a divine creation of God. Your path is unique and special. Get on with your purpose. Fear of suffering. Get rid of it. You cannot suffer when you know your sacred self. Only the person you imagine yourself to be suffers. Your joy is divine, and so is your suffering. All of the woe is a part of God's plan, bringing transcendent wisdom when you stop judging it. Fear of isolation. Get rid of it. You can never be alone. When you know this, you will never fear loneliness. There is a gigantic support network of loving souls with you on a similar path. Know that to be true. Stay focused on your purpose and forget about being isolated. When you do this, all of the guidance and love that you need will begin to be known by you. Fear of looking foolish. Get rid of it. When you are doing the work of the higher self, you are always on purpose. Whether others judge you as foolish or not is irrelevant. And finally, fear of success. Get rid of it. Replace the fear with knowing that you deserve any prosperity or abundance that comes your way. Know that when you are on the way of your sacred quest, external measures of success will appear. Your success, however, is an inner matter. It is your personal feeling about yourself, and certainly you do not want to be afraid of yourself. These, then, are the six fears that interfere the most with the way of our divine purpose. Know that you possess the inner tools to transform your life, and the fear will be gone before you can utter, get rid of it. One of those inner tools is to acknowledge to yourself when fear enters your personal picture. When you do notice yourself experiencing fear, please be sure to gently allow it into your awareness. Feel it and refuse to judge it. The first time I had ever walked out on stage to speak before thousands of people and had forgotten my notes, I experienced severe feelings of fear. Not acknowledging my fear would have kept it right there on stage with me. But I surrendered to the fear while I reminded myself that I was not alone. I went out on that stage with my fear as my companion. Before even a few minutes had passed, I was absorbed in my mission and my fear was gone. By acknowledging the fear and then doing what you were afraid of anyway, 
you serve notice on those kinds of self-defeating thoughts. You also take a giant step toward banishing doubt from your life. Fear and doubt are partners. That which you doubt will cause you to be afraid. That which you fear creates doubts about your ability to deal with it. Faith is an antidote to fear and doubt. In most cases, the use of the word faith is associated with developing a religious framework for our lives. Faith and worship in this context go together. I'm not talking about faith this way. I honor whatever your religious persuasion is, but I do not want you to confuse religious beliefs with the actual presence of faith. Faith is akin to knowing God, which is different than believing in God or knowing about God. Knowing, as I am speaking about it, is an experience on a cellular level of personal experience which has not one iota of doubt attached to it. To me, faith is an inner knowing and a capacity to see God in everything, including myself. This kind of faith does not come from books. The kind of faith I am describing does not need a religious service or a holy book. It comes from having the direct inner experience of God as a part of your higher self. It is demonstrated in countless ways in daily life. You do not necessarily have to see this inner light with your senses, yet the experience is known. You know that what you do not see is there for you as well. I've seen my wife, Marceline, demonstrate this inner faith on seven different occasions when she has given birth to our children. Throughout her pregnancies, she talks to me about her faith in God being with her. She knows that bringing a child into the world is more than a physical experience. She knows that it is a holy opportunity that she has been entrusted with. She has absolutely no doubt about her ability to proceed through all stages of her labor and childbirth without complications, pain, or any suffering. This faith literally puts her into a higher state of awareness, and her physical appearance literally changes. She has actually left the confines of her body. Through the power of her miraculous concentration on what she has to do, she proceeds unaware of surrounding distractions. Her inner faith has literally seemed to banish the doubt about her ability to deliver a baby in a spiritual and pain-free environment. She doesn't believe that God is there for her. She absolutely knows it. The idea of any doubt being present is ludicrous to her. I have been in the labor room with my wife while women all around her were out of control with fear and doubt. Marceline, relying on her faith, is participating in the act of creation as an observer and a faithful participant. In fact, she has taken that same inner knowing based on faith to assist other women in having their babies. She accompanies them through the entire process from the first months of pregnancy through delivery, helping them access their inner selves and reassuring them that if they banish doubt, they will have a spiritual childbirth experience. I have yet to see it fail. Understand that faith is a decision that you make internally. It is a mental decision to know that everything is on purpose. Faith then becomes an energy that resides within you at all times. Rumi said, uh, this ancient Persian poet, brilliant, beautiful poet, he said, uh, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. It feels like bewilderment. It feels like awe. It feels like, uh, even as I think about it now, I can feel myself tearing up behind my eyes because you know, only I know what is going on behind my eyeballs. Um, it feels like so, um, so glorious and, and, um, and so, um, so sweet and so, uh, so trusting, so knowing, you know, there's, there's just this powerful knowing that you're not alone. There's this, uh, you know, that it's like, there's a safety, there's a sense of that you're not alone. Um, and behind the feeling we're talking about here is this, this feeling of, of, of aloneness for so many people who are lost in the world, that, they, that I don't have like a connection to something greater than myself. I've come to believe that who I am is, is what I do and what I have and what, what other people think about me and, and who I am is separate from everybody else and, and who I am is, uh, is separate even from what I'd like to attract into my life, that I'm separate from all the things that are missing and I'm separate even from God and that there's there's a place within me that knows that I'm not separate from any of that 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 if there's no place that God is not or that source is not or that the energy that provides that is always giving and always creating is not if there's no place that it is not then it has to be in me I know that 
And if there's no place that it's not, and it has to be in me, it has to be also in everything that is missing in my life, or that I think is missing. It's there too. So that in some mysterious, invisible way, I'm already connected to everything that's missing in my life through something called spirit. And when I recognized that, that I'm not here as, as this human being having a spiritual experience, when you recognize that your essence is that you are, you are a spiritual being, having a human experience, not the other way around. When you really get that, I mean, not that you can say it and it's clever, but when you know that who you are is this essence, you don't see, there's no other, there's no them. There's no, nothing outside of you. You're, you're connected to everyone and everything. As the Native Americans, you'd say that no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. <laughs> your body wasn't made by your parents. You like, we like to think that our bodies were made by our parents. That's because you look a certain way and all of that. But if we take the tiny little drop of protoplasm that uh, created your, created you, and we try to find out its origin, and we take it all the way back to sub, sub, subatomic particles and reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. We find out when we put it in a particle accelerator and, re and re rev it up at 250,000 miles an hour and collide it, and we open it up, there's nothing there. That you came from the invisible, you came from source. It's the spirit that gives light. So that once you understand that this body of yours is a creation not of human beings, but it's a creation of God, it's a creation of source, it's a creation, it came from nowhere and an invisible source and manifest it into the world of the physical and so it can it only reacts to um it only reacts to truth because it's it's it was created by truth so once you lie this is an ultimate lie detector test that's why i said we could have saved 93 million dollars with president clinton <laughs> you know it's like come on come on did you have sex or didn't you let's we get over this you know uh but 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 now you're using an instrument of not of human beings you all of our bodies are, are divine creations and they only re they only react to truth with strength the truth that you the, when you go weak you're, you're going against your Tao nature. Your true nature is not revenge. Your true nature is not hatred. You came from love. Mm -hmm. And you have to stay in that state. And once you, once you learn that, once you get that, once you, like having that demonstrated could change your life. Just that moment could change forever. People ask me, what is your, your biggest confusion about humanity? It's like man's inhumanity to man. This, this, non, this recognition that we are something beyond ego. You know, and, and we don't, ha you know, we, we have a divided world, a world that believes that, you know, if you're male, you're different than if you're female. If you're Muslim, you're different than if you're Christian. If you're, you know, if you're born on one side of the river, then you're different uh, than the person who wasn't. Uh, and we've, we've taken on all of these ego beliefs. And I think the new generation, this generation, it's, um, they have to, they're not going to, their job isn't to end a war. <laughs> it's to end war. It's to end the concept of war. And the concept of war comes out of this ego identification of who we are and a belief that I am what I have and I am what I do and I am what others think of me and I am separate from everyone, separate, separate from God, separate from what's missing, this idea of separation and so on. And we will inch by inch move towards a place where people will begin to recognize their connection to each other rather than their separation or we'll have to just start all over. We'll have to start it over. As Einstein said, if the, the next war that is fought, he said, the, uh, after the next, after this one, will be fought with, uh, you know, with sticks again. Uh, we'll have to start all over again. We'll have to start all over. And um, it's really about slaying this ego, this this massive ego thing. It's you can see it in our foreign policy. You can see it in the way that we treat it. You can see it on television. You can see it in all of the all of the ads that you see for having to take pills for everything. It's, a, and that's what I feel. My my. Uh, my work is, is about, what my life is about now, is, is ending the concept of, of hatred and separation. It's about practicing this idea of not putting your thoughts on what is missing and shifting it to, it's on its way. It's on its way. It's on its way. Four words, just get them tattooed someplace inside of you. Whatever it is that you would like to attract into your life, know that it's on its way. And I want to say to you that as you begin to get your thoughts more harmonized with Tao thinking, that is with the thinking of the source, the thinking of God, 
that which always has been, that which does nothing but leaves nothing undone, as you begin to more and more harmonize in this way, what happens is that you start elevating your thoughts so that the habit of how you think becomes more harmonized rather than a polarity with what you want to attract, it becomes harmonized with it and it becomes your natural way of how you think all the time. And you start then beginning to teach your children the same way of thinking. So you just catch them when they start saying things like, oh, with my luck it won't work out. Why have any of us ever learned to say, with my luck, and having it mean things aren't going to work out? Why wouldn't you say, and just have it as your habit, with my luck, it'll probably show up faster than it normally does. Why not have that kind of a way? Because what, here's what happens. As you begin to shift the way that you think and have an anticipation that this thing is going to work out for you, you can only act upon your thoughts. And as you, as, as you get these higher and higher thoughts, what happens is that, that the thought is now more aligned with what it is you want to attract and then you start acting upon that thought. And as you start acting upon the thought that it will work out, that it's probably on its way, you start to see how this whole system all works. In other words, call it the universe, whatever you want, begins to conspire with you. It begins to act almost in where, where you suddenly become a collaborator with fate. And instead of fate being something that just might or might not happen to you, you're in collaboration with what it is that you want to attract. I mean, ask any physician, there's physicians here today, ask them about something called the will to live. Ask them about somebody who's going in for a corneal transplant and thinks that I'm going to see when this thing is done rather than someone who thinks it probably won't work out. And which one would they rather work with? What is this thing called the will to live? What is this thing, this inner kind of thing that says, I refuse to allow myself to think and they've done research on this, uh, you know, in, in, in studies on gerontology, where the, what does your life look like from 60 plus versus what does your life look like below, from 60 uh, down to into your 20s? That people who live a dynamic life into their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, people who feel strong, who don't feel that getting older means that I have to in any way decline any place, physically or mentally. Getting older has nothing to do with the concept of declining. That when people are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, and this is their perception of what their life is going to be like when they are in their 60s, that those people have a much greater chance, much greater chance, of not attracting the kinds of diseases that are so much age related as do people who think of old as infirm and declining throughout their 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. That you change the way you believe about that and you say declining is not a possibility. And we can create the kind of world that we want to create when enough of us begin to say not part of my consciousness. Nope, I don't buy gossip. No, I don't buy violence. No, I don't have anything to do with that. And you just turn the channel, you turn it off. I pick up a Time magazine when I get on a flight and I go through and I say, I won't read the stories that involve killing. I won't read this. I don't need to hear any more about any more people blowing themselves up. I don't need to continue to have that as a part of my consciousness because I want to be someone who radiates out God-realized thinking. That's what I want to do. And I can't do that if I'm constantly being imbued with that. So I just go through the pages, page, page. And usually I say, oh, just threw away another $4.95. There's nothing in it to read. Every once in a while, a good story about maybe Tiger Woods or something. But by and large, there's not much in there. And you don't have to fill yourself with that kind of energy. But you've got, to have, you've got to change your awareness of yourself, as Maslow said. And one of the ways that you change your aware, awareness of yourself is to understand a very, simple, a very simple premise. Think of an apple pie. Here's an apple pie. And this apple pie, you take this apple pie and you take a slice of this apple pie and you put it over here. And then 
you walk over to the slice and you say to the apple pie, the slice of apple pie, what are you like? What are you like? And the little slice of apple pie says, I must be like what I came from. You wouldn't expect it to be pineapple. You wouldn't expect it to be cherry. You would expect it to be like what it came from, right? So why is it that we understand this, and yet we don't understand that we too must be like what we came from? We must be, we are, we are pieces of God. We came from a divine source. We have, to, we have to trust in our divinity. We have to understand that we are not this package of bones and skin encapsulating you know, these internal organs, that that's not who we are. That's what we call the false self. It's an illusion. That who we really are is what we came from. And what we came from is eternal, it's infinite, it's kind, it's unlimited, it is, excludes no one. So that if we understand that we are really here as spiritual beings, just having a human experience, not the other way around. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We, our essence is our greatness, what we came from. We must be like what we came from. I've just taken up this new practice. It's called yoga. Now, I'm 65 years old, and I've decided that there are certain things that I was told that I couldn't do at earlier stages of my life that I've decided I'm taking on. I don't care what my age is or what anybody else is told. What Mrs. McConnell told me in the sixth grade at Marquette Elementary School in Detroit that um, you don't have to come to art class. Um, it's really not for you. <laughs> You, you can go dribble basketballs, maybe, but uh, you don't want to come to art. This is because she saw some of my uh, stick drawings that uh, I was pretty proud of. And then there was Mr. Tubbs at Denby High School in Detroit, who, when I turned in my first drawing in uh, <coughs> drafting class, I didn't even know what drafting was. I just signed, they threw, it, they threw me in there because the, the school was so overcrowded. It was my elective. And I turned in my first drawing, and he asked me the question, do you have a little sister? <laughs> like in the third grade? Because she perhaps is the one that did this way. That was my uh, whole view of my artistic ability. I'm out there painting now. I'm doing painting. And I'm also doing yoga, all right? And I've learned some things about myself in, in the process of doing this. It was like a change in attitude, a shift a belief system that I no longer was hanging on to. And that's what we have to do. There's no, it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your beliefs have been. It doesn't matter what other people have tried to convince you of in the past. When you move into spirit and have a knowing that I have the capacity to be able to do this, you leave behind the false self. And the false self is really nothing more than this ego. Look, you came from a divine place a divine place that is unlimited, that says you can be anything you put your attention on. And then you bought into a whole series of beliefs that were handed to you by very well-meaning people attempting to convince you that you had limitations, that you couldn't do this, that this wasn't possible. And I'd like to suggest to you that you took on something called an ego. E-G-O, an ego. You came in from divinity, you came in from a place of unlimited, you show up and you edged God out. E-G-O. And when you edge God out, it doesn't mean that you're sacrilegious, it doesn't mean that you're not a, uh, a moral person, it means that you take on a belief system that says, who I am is no longer this infinite divine being who can step outside and observe this body and believe that he can make it do whatever I put my attention on and use it to have the same powers that is spoken about in, in the New Testament. Even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things, it's in within each and every one of us, except that we bought into an idea that who we are is what we have, who we are is what we do, who we are is what other people think I am, who I am 
is separate from everybody else, who I am is separate from what I would like to attract into my life, and who I am is separate from my source. And we believe in this separation and we believe in this identity that who I am is what I have. So we start accumulating. We accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. The problem is that when you stop accumulating and if who you are is what you accumulate, then you have no value as soon as your things start to disappear, as soon as they wear out, as soon as somebody else takes them, as soon as the government taxes them, as soon as any number of things. Who I am is what I do. If you no longer can do, then you aren't. You no longer exist. Who I am is my reputation. And we raise our children often to believe that what's most important is what other people think of you. Fit in. Do what, do what you've been told to do. Do what the crowd does. Follow the herd. And you know what happens is what you step in when you follow the herd. <laughs> so we take on all of these sort of false ideas and we have a tendency to believe them. And, and inspiration is moving back into spirit. And it's moving back into spirit in such a way that you no longer accept yourself as anything other than divine. Here's what Patanjali says. When a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from falsehood, he attains the power, you won't be able to write fast enough to do this, he attains the power of obtaining for himself and others the fruits of God of good deeds without having to perform these deeds. Now let me, let me tell you what this means. When a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from falsehood, that doesn't mean he stops lying, it means he no longer identifies himself with the ego. He identifies or she identifies himself or herself with the spirit. I am no longer what I have, what I do, and what others think of me. I am the beloved. I am connected to God. When Sai Baba was asked the question in front of over a million people, are you God? This man who performs miracles, this man who has the gift of fish and loaves, he said, yes I am. And so are you. He said, the only difference is that I know it and you doubt it. When Patanjali identifies the false self, or rather falsehood, as identifying with the false self. Vivekananda, a great student of Ramakrishna, when he was asked the question, how do I reach this higher level of consciousness? He put it this way. He said, in the springtime, go out and observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. He said, the blossoms vanish of themselves as the fruit grows so too will the lower self vanish as the divine grows within you. Let the divine grow within you. Bring spirit to. Secondly, when a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from harming others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in his presence. This is St. Francis. When you no longer... When you are steadfast in your abstention from ever wanting to harm, that is, think harmful thoughts towards others, all living creatures will experience love in your presence and will be tamed. Third, to know the inner nature of an object or a person is to gain power. As the aspirant, that is each and every one of us, grows in concentration he may find himself suddenly possessed of psychic powers. He may be able to heal the sick, to read others' thoughts, to foresee the future, or to control certain natural forces. And all it takes is a power of concentration, meditation, and absorption. As you go there, you will begin to see yourself healing and having these powers that you thought were not available to you. Fourth, when a person's energy field reaches the highest, most complex vibrations from imagining or meditation, the person had spiritual experiences regardless of their beliefs. As you begin to vibrate at 100,000 cycles per second, these experiences will be there whether you want them or not. Fifth, it is only possible, and this is always very intriguing to me, it is only possible for God to express God's self in you when you are at peace. If you're not at peace, you have sent God out of your life. And when you send God out of your life, you send healing 
and miracles and all the things I've been speaking about. Sixth, disease and discord have no power over you except through your belief in them. Disease has no power over you except through your belief in it. Let go of the belief in it, and it no longer has power over you. And a woman came to Nisargadatta, who had given up all of his worldly possessions, who was a school teacher from England, who had cancer, and she was pleading with him to listen to her case. And she got very impatient with him and said to him, um, I have so many problems, and he said, you do not have any problems. And she said, how can you say that? He said, because your body has problems, but you don't have any problems. And she said, but I suffer. And as you heard me say earlier, he said, you do not suffer. Only the person you imagine yourself to be suffers. And then he gave what I consider the most powerful affirmation I've ever heard, which is I use every day. I have it written in my uh, car and on the mirror where I shave in the morning. He said, she said to him, you mean to tell me that you don't have any problems and you don't suffer? And uh, he said to her, ma'am, he said, in my world, nothing ever goes wrong. Now there's an affirmation. In my world, nothing ever goes wrong. I don't live in the world of the body and the ego. I live in the world of the spirit. And I am the witness to all of the rest of this. And I'm not attached to the outcome. I had a patient coming to me when I was a therapist years ago in New York, out on uh, the island, when I was teaching at the university. And uh, her name is Noreen. And Noreen uh, was a chronic depressive, and she came to me depressed and was told uh, that uh, this was a guy who wasn't going to sit around and be your friend, and you weren't going to purchase a friend. We're going to see about changing things, or we're not going to be in therapy together. And she said, uh, I asked her, I said, uh, how long have you been depressed? And she said, I've been depressed for years and years. I said, is there any ever time when you are not depressed? She said, I am always depressed. So I was looking for an entry point. I said, um, is there any organ in your body, perhaps, any part of your body that isn't depressed? She said, my, every organ in my body is depressed. I said, well, let's look at your dreams. When you sleep at night, are you? She said, I go to bed depressed. I take Prozac. I wake up depressed. I eat depressed. There is no part of me that is not depressed. She was really into her depression. <laughs> and she was. I mean, she looked it and acted it, and, and she wasn't kidding, and it was serious. I don't make light of it. And I said to her, Noreen, I said, uh, <clears throat> I said, I asked her the key question. I said, tell me, I said, uh, have you been noticing your depression more lately? And she said, yes, I have. That's why I've come to you, because the other therapy hasn't worked, and I really thought maybe you could offer me some hope. So I said, so you have been noticing it more lately? She said, yes. I said, well, then tell me, is the noticer depressed? And she was stumped. And that's where we began, with the noticer, who cannot be depressed. The noticer just is the compassionate witness. That's where you have to go in your life. You want to rid yourself of pain? You want to rid yourself of, uh, of struggle, of suffering? You begin to observe it and not attach yourself to it. You watch your body do what it has to do. And you can see it. As you become the compassionate witness and you understand quantum mechanics, you begin to see that where you place your attention, the observer, that which you observe, and keep on observing, that's what you begin to manifest. And the physical world becomes a reflection of how you witness. The observer himself or herself literally affects the outcome. And you can truly learn to manifest and control your coincidences, like us meeting like my former department head showing up, like all of you who've had these kinds of things happen to you in your life. You can begin through the process of witnessing to see it begin to manifest. If you abandon the doubt, if you erase the past, if you get rid of all the labels, you have got to let go of your, of your Italianness, your Jewishness, your maleness, your conservativeness, your Arizonaness, your blackness, your whiteness. 
your oldness, your youngness. You are none of those things. You are a spiritual being, divine and eternal. And all the emphasis that you place on this physical world and the physical things that divide us will keep you back in the ego. There are no white people. There are no black people. There are no women. There are no men. As Gandhi said, in heaven there is no religion. There's nothing to divide any of us. When you see yourself as the witness, you eliminate all of those things. And once you've been able to cultivate the witness, you can begin to observe your body. You can observe your thoughts. You can see that you're not your thoughts. You are, you are that person who is thinking them. And you can literally place your attention on which ones you want and which ones you don't want. The fact is that everything in this physical universe doesn't meet the definition of what is real. Who you are is that soul that I spoke about a few moments ago. That soul that says, I want to expand. I want to be free. I want to go to a place where I understand that who I am is birthless, deathless, changeless, and live from that place. Because what this involves fundamentally is reprogramming yourself from the belief system that has been your ego. The part of us that has come to believe that who we are is what we have. And who we are is what we do. And who we are is what other people think of us, like our reputation. And who we are is separate from each other. And most egregiously, who we are is separate from God, from our source. And so we've been raised and taken out into the world and said, go out there and prove who you are by achieving, by accumulating, by getting other people to like you. <clears throat> I wrote a book and did a film not too long ago called The Shift. And one of the, thank you. <laughs> and in there I spoke about and used these words. The direction we take in life is far more important than the place that our ego parks us in this present moment. That who we are is this divine, infinite being that keeps occupying new bodies endlessly until we leave this body and then move on. And there is no beginning. There is no end. There is only now, each and every one of us. So the soul, the part of you that is extraordinary, the part of you that came into this world and knows I can be anything, I can do anything, I can accomplish anything that I place my attention on. Because if you want to accomplish something, you must first just expect it of yourself. And this means changing around the expectations that you've been conditioned to believe are your dharma or are your destiny. I am limited. I am <clears throat> not entitled to prosperity. I am unable to deal with my physical ailments. I need something else. I need to take pills in order to do it. I need to have somebody else do it for me that within each and every one of us, there is this marvelous knowing that is really and truly God ourselves, each and every one of us. The soul does not like when you get fenced in, when it is told what to do, when it's told it has limitations, when it's told it can't become that. And so many of us go through our life with these enormous limitations that we've placed upon ourselves that have been handed to us from the time that we were little boys and little girls.